Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to Luncheon with the Experts, a carcinoid cancer foundation program brought to you by Lexicon Pharmaceuticals. My name is Rain Bennett. Uh, if you don't know me yet, there are many of you who tune in every week, so you have gotten to know me a little bit and that makes me excited. I am a filmmaker and I've been working with CCF for about 10 years now to create video content that helps spread awareness and education about neuroendocrine tumors. And you can see a lot of that content here on the Facebook page or on CCF's YouTube channel. Uh, CCF's Facebook Live Lunch with the Expert series is made possible by the support of Lexicon Pharmaceuticals. So we always want to send a, ba- a big thank you to them. We would not be able to do this program for you if we didn't have their support. And just a quick disclaimer from them, we want to tell you that the opinions, the opinions expressed by the guest presenters, as well as the questions asked by the audience that you all at home have not been created or suggested by the sponsors of the Facebook Live program, and the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation doesn't in- endorse nor promote any of the views, opinions, or information in the presentation. Audience members should not rely solely on the opinions or information expressed by the guest and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health or treatments. So all of that is a wordy way to say, we're going to give you some advice here and hopefully direction in, uh, on this journey that you're a part of but by no means uh, is this specific to your case. And by all means, you should talk to your, your health team, right? Your providers and make the plan with them. Hopefully we can help you along that journey. So today our guest is Dr. James Howell from the University of Iowa. How are you, doctor? Doing well, thank you, Rain. Absolutely, it's good to see you again. Can you tell the people at home a little bit about like who you are and, and what you do in the neuroendocrine cancer space? Well, I'm a surgical oncologist. I'm at the University of Iowa. I'm the uh, head of the Division of Surgical Oncology in Endocrine Surgery. Mm-hmm. Um, my role is a, both a clinician and a researcher. Uh, I take care of patients who need surgical care so I do a lot of operations for small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, their lymph node metastases and liver metastases, as well as pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, duodenal, gastric. Uh, and that's really the bulk of my clinical practice, maybe about two thirds of it. I'm lucky because I practice with a great group of people here at the University of Iowa. We have uh, ENET uh, accredited center of excellence and my colleagues in endocrinology, Dr. Odoricio and Dr. Dillon, and uh, medical oncology, Dr. Chandra Sakharan and Dr. Berg are, are, are really the core of the team. And then we have, you know, great pathologists we work with and nuclear medicine uh, physicians as well. So I'm very lucky to be able to practice with such accomplished people. We also uh, do a lot of neuroendocrine tumor research. And I have a laboratory where we look at the genetics of neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, we're looking mostly at RNA expression, which basically looks at gene expression, and that can kind of give hints to us about new drug treatments for these kind of tumors. Um, We have the uh, Only Spore grant, which is a large uh, multi-project grant uh, on neuroendocrine tumors uh, here at the University of Iowa, and our PI is Dr. Sue Odorisu, who's a pediatric hematologist oncologist and a pioneer in developing um, imaging uh, and treatment of not just kids with these tumors, but uh, that's been translated in adults. And for a long time, we were able to give uh, peptide rate receptor therapy before it was approved nationally, before the NETR1 trial, and, and also do, doing gallium PETs. So we've really, I've been very fortunate to practice in an environment uh, which is really geared towards uh, cutting edge research and clinical care of patients with NETs. And uh, so I guess that's my background. I I should also mention um, I'm the president of the North American Neuroendocrine Tumor Society and also the Society of Surgical Oncology, which is a a group of cancer surgeons, not necessarily dedicated to neuroendocrine tumors, but all tumors. Um, Right. So with that background, I think that's everything you need to know about me. (laughs) Yeah. So so obviously everybody at home, Dr. Howell, is is well-versed in this disease and has spent a lot of time um, working on this and developing his expertise. Uh, I just want to say it looks like some of you all already know the drill and are saying hello and telling us where you're from in the world. As always, we love to hear that and see how far we are, are reaching with these programs. And uh, I do want to say that that we also provide video 
a video series that we're currently in the middle of releasing right now. And Dr. Howell referenced a few other doctors who are colleagues with him. And I have to agree, I've, I've, sh I've shot some video with them at the University of Iowa, and it's an amazing team there, Dr. Tom Odoricio, Dr. Dylan, and Dr. Sue Odoricio. Um, so specifically about Dr. Sue Odoricio, we just released a new video in that series called Neuroendocrine Tumors in Children. It is here on the Facebook page as well as the YouTube channel. Definitely recommend you checking that out. It's, it's uh, a lot of time. I know this is important to CCF, but a lot of time we think a neuroendocrine tumor or neuro, neuroendocrine cancer tends to only or, or primarily um, affect people of an older age. And it's not true. In fact, people are younger and younger are getting diagnosed. And so uh, Dr. Sue Odoricio is doing amazing work and it's a really powerful story that, uh, that I was happy to tell. So check that out when you have some time. So today is Luncheon with the Experts. This is the fifth time we've done this, this weekly talk show. And it's a little deeper dive into the members of the NET communities, doctors, patients, uh, uh, support group leaders, all the people that make up the community. So feel free to send in your questions. Obviously, Dr. Howell has certain areas, surgery, gene expression, things that he knows very, very well and, and in depth that, that I think the, you would get the most value out of. But he's agreed to give us his, his hour today. So no questions are, are, are uh, off, off limits, although he, may, he, may, he has the right of refusal. If they're, if they're too personal, I'm going to let him make that judgment call. Uh, but send them all in, let us know, and, uh, and hopefully we can, we can help you today. We'll try to get all your questions. But if we don't, as I always say, I encourage you to follow up with Carson and Cancer Foundation either here on their Facebook page, you can send them a direct message, or at carsonoid.org. And lastly, before we get going, we just want to say that we know it's super challenging to be a net patient or a person seeking diagnosis, especially during this crazy time of the pandemic. Uh, so just know that we uh, at CCF are here for you whenever you need us, and we want to continue to provide programs like this. So if you would like to show your support and help us continue to provide these programs, if you've received some value and want to reciprocate that, an easy way to do that is just to text, text the word experts to the number 1-914-380-7323. Again, that's experts to 914-380-7323. Every donation helps, it really does. And we will put that and any other links to resources that come up today in, in the conversation uh, in the comment section uh, on the Facebook Live broadcast. So um, feel, feel free to refer to those. We're gonna try to give you all the information that we have, but. Um, don't hesitate to reach out if, if, if we skipped over something. So hello, we're seeing hello from all over the States. Oh, we've got good evening from South Africa. Thanks, Carmen. Great to see you. All right. So um, Dr. Howe, how long, how long would you say that you've been working with this, this disease? Well, I mean, in general surgical training, you would, you would see it, but it, you know, that was about 30 years ago and it wasn't as common as it is now. And right. so in my residency, I saw some PNET cases. Can't even remember seeing any SBNET cases. And even in my fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering, we took care of some PNETs, but probably didn't see too many SBNETs. But really when I got to Iowa, uh, about three years after I got somebody to help them out here, and they enlisted me then. And, you know, Tom just brought in people from all over the place uh, who I could start seeing and, and get expertise and, and really start taking care of. So I'd say that was about 1999. How much has the treatment of this disease and the knowledge of this disease progressed since, since, since back then, since when you began? Oh, just it's been explosive. I mean, crazy. Yeah, I mean, it was it was considered an orphan disease at the time, but really, if a couple of years after that, it was about 2000, 2001, where small bowel neuroendocrine tumors became the most common type of small bowel tumor. We didn't really know this until 10 years later, uh, but it was right about that time where it surpassed adenocarcinoma as the most common type of, of small bowel cancer. And as people have heard many times before, the incidence has increased by about sixfold over the last 30 years or so. So with that, there's been a lot more interest because people are seeing more patients. Um, as surgeons, still, it's not that common a disease. Each surgeon, a general surgeon in the community may only see a few cases in their lifetime. But, um, 
you know, that's increasing and the knowledge is increasing. We've been writing a lot about this. Uh, so I think uh, the information is out there. A lot of my colleagues, Dr. Pommier, Dr. Koiken, who did a, a series uh, of this uh, webinar like a few weeks ago, uh, is a younger surgeon who has interest in this area. There are lots of really good people who are out there who are writing a lot about these things. So the word is getting out. And in medical oncology, it's amazing how many people have decided to focus their careers on, on this disease as well. And the explosion really has been nuclear medicine. I mean, with the mm -hmm. advent of the Netter 1 trial and gallium dotatate, dotatox scanning, um, all of a sudden there's been a huge explosion of interest in that community as well. Absolutely. So you, you said something there that made me uh, wonder uh, when you're talking about younger doctors that are, that are going into this, this, you know, realm, this neuroendocrine tumor um, journey, uh, specializing in this, what, what was it that made you really, I know you work on, uh, this is not the only type of tumor or cancer that you deal with, but w was there something that stood out about this disease that made you want to dive so deeply into it when you were just starting out? Well, I would say the first thing was really Dr. Tom Odorizio's enthusiasm. He kind of right. he, he kind of got me interested. And as I started taking care of more patients, one of the things I realized is this population of patients knows more about their disease than any other population of patients that I've ever met. And that's kind of challenging as a physician because these people come armed with all this knowledge, and it really puts you... Uh, in a position of having to know your stuff as well. So it, yeah. it challenges all of us to, uh, to be the best we can be. The other thing is that, um, you know, I take care of patients with pancreatic adenocarcinoma, for example, and mm. it doesn't matter how good of an operation you do on those people. A lot of times it's the biology of the disease and the fact that that's a bad disease where people die early, even with a perfect operation or with good medical therapy. Whereas neuroendocrine tumors, it's different. People live a long time, and you have the luxury of, of rolling out a number of different therapies over time to, to keep people alive and keep them in good health for a, a much longer time period. So you establish longer relationships with patients, and it also allows us surgically to be more creative with trying to cite or reduce disease uh, for this particular cancer that we wouldn't even think about with, say, pancreas adenocarcinoma or stomach cancer or some other cancers like that. Got it. Got it. Well, we're starting to get some some questions in, Doctor Hal. So I'd like to to pivot and and you and I can can talk as the uh, as the program goes on. But um, the questions tend to to start flooding in when they come in. So uh, if that's okay with you, we're going to start fielding some questions from the audience. Sound good? Yeah. All right. Um, and just so everybody knows. Um, we, we obviously can't, or Dr. Howe can't answer questions that are very case specific. So I've instructed him, I've told him if, if we get those questions, we'll either try to ask you to rephrase it or he'll try to answer in, in generic terms and still give you some, um, some, some help with that, with your, uh, with your issues. So first of all, we have Carmen who says, is there a test that can inform us if we're predisposed to carcinoid syndrome specifically? And we can talk for a moment exactly what carcinoid syndrome is and then is there a test that you know of that, that can tell someone if they're predisposed to that? Well, that's a great question, Carmen. And I, I, the answer is I wish there was a better test. Um, we're doing research in this area and the NIH, as you, many of you know, are doing research in this area as well, trying to find families with, with small bowel carcinoids and doing uh, exome sequencing, that is sequencing all the genes and trying to figure figure out the predisposing genes to this. And the NIH was, um, was able to identify one gene that causes uh, familial small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, but in despite the fact that they have about 60 families that they've been studying, they've only found this mutation in one family. So the answer is for that particular gene, um, it, it, although it gives clues to why they form in people, um, it's only useful so far for that family. And we're doing similar efforts with exome sequencing in families that we have. And it's a very challenging thing to do because the ability to identify predisposing genes like you're, you're suggesting, you know, that we could test for to see if you're going to get the disease, uh, 
is hampered by having just small families. And in other words, to identify a gene uh, that causes cancer, it really helps to have a family with 11 or more people. Mm. It's exceedingly rare to find families of that size with sure. the, these types of tumors. Um, so the answer for the genetic test is, is no, there is no simple genetic test. But as far as other tests, you know, people will measure biochemical markers, 5-HIA in the urine, uh, serotonin, chromogranin, and pancreas statin. There's the NET test, which is a, a messenger RNA test. There's a variety of different things that you can do to identify patients who have tumors already, if they're big enough to secrete enough hormones to be able to be detected. But to know 10 years from now that you're going to have the disease really is going to require a genetic test that we don't have yet. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Hopefully that helps Carmen. Okay. Next we have a question from Heather. Heather says, what would you suggest to someone that has gone through four rounds of PRRT and ended up with MDS? What treatments are left for them? Metastasis all over, including bone. Um, and let's also establish what MDS is for those at home. Well, MDS is myelodysplastic syndrome, and um, patients who get radioactive isotopes for treatment of cancers or other things can develop a hit on their bone marrow. And so myelodysplastic syndrome is when your, your bone marrow takes, uh, you know, is affected by these radioactive isotopes. In other words, you might have low white blood cells, low platelets, maybe even low red blood cells. Myelodysplastic syndrome can also progress to leukemia. Fortunately, this doesn't happen that often in patients who get PRRT. The incidence is about 2% to maybe as high as 4%. So it's a, it's a low number. But to get back to your question, what can you do now if you've developed that? Well, I, I've got to say, when you have that, you're in a very fragile state. And uh, clearly, you can't get any more PRT because that'll hurt the bone marrow some more. Uh, um, chemotherapy could be dangerous because you're already going to be immunosuppressed. Um, if you have bone disease that's causing pain or at risk for fracture, then local radiation would be an option. Um, but the, uh, and somatostatin analogs would certainly be, be fine as well. But the options do become much more limited if you have that situation. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Dr. Howell. Heather, hope that gives you a little bit of information. Sorry to hear about that. Um, okay. Lots of people. Hello from Washington. We're, we're, we're all over. Okay. Okay, so Claire, I see a question from you. What about when the disease has spread to the liver? I don't know if that's in reference to something else we've said, but uh, we might need a little bit more context to get to to that. Um, okay, Susan says, Dr. Howe, is there any research going on as a potential treatment for NETs with neurokinin-1 one, one receptors such as, uh, is it, tri uh, how do you say that word? Try to try to <laughs> Tridipident. Is that accurate? Um, <laughs> sorry. I'm not sure if I heard the question. Okay, sorry. Uh, is there any research going on? This is this is sometimes the uh, difficulties with text and then me uh, not knowing everything. Is there any research going on as a potential treatment for NETs with neurokinin one receptors? Okay. All right. I'm no. I'm not familiar with with that. Um, okay. So I, I can't really answer that. Yeah, I know so neurokinin A is a helpful maybe, marker. Yeah, maybe she. Yeah, maybe she's meaning that. So that's that might have been lost. Susan, if you're still there, please. Uh, can you can you write back and comment on your question and uh, and and give us a little more more clarity on that? We'd love to be able to help you out today, uh, Doctor Howe. Okay. Next, we have a question from Joy that says, "Have you seen genetic family dip neck patients?" And dip dip neck is a is a something that we're actually creating a video on very shortly in our series. Yeah, I'm being a. A surgical oncologist, uh, I'm more specialized in the abdominal cavity, um, so I don't see a lot of patients with lung lesions. And dip neck is an early precursor. It's kind of like a bronchial carcinoid, but um, uh, more diffuse and uh, 
my knowledge is limited to like the talks I've heard at Nanets, where, where, where thoracic oncologists have talked about this. So, I, and I don't know of any families with it. So, my, but I got to say my knowledge in, the, in the lung nets is a little more limited. And Joy, I will say that uh, we're, we are working on creating the video for lung nets and dip neck. And we got on pause, you know, our production schedule got on pause because of the coronavirus. So we're resuming soon under very strict safety measures. And so I'll, I'll actually bring that up uh, to the doctors we speak to for that video. And hopefully we can get a, a you know, get some more information on that for you. So stay tuned for that. Um, real quick, Dr. Howe, you, you know, you mentioned Nanets a couple of times. Can you tell me a little bit about that organization and, and what its mission or, or objective is and what, what, how it functions, what it does? Yeah, I mean, it stands for the North American Neuroendocrine Tumor Society. And it's, it's really a group of physicians from multiple specialties who really specialize in take care, taking care of neuroendocrine tumor patients. Um, just as a side, as a, as a surgeon, most societies belong to our surgeon and other, uh, you know, have a group of speakers uh, who educate us all on different areas like dip necks. That's where I hear about dip necks uh, that we just talked about. Uh, we also have abstracts that get presented with cutting edge research, both clinical and basic science and, and posters. And it's a, just a great, usually it's a two day in-person meeting. Well, we have a pre-meeting for uh, nurse practitioners and for young investigators the day before the two day meeting. And it's a great way for people to interact with one another and, and learn all about all different aspects of neuroendocrine tumors. The, the society's been around for about 10 years now. We just had our 10 year anniversary last year. Congrats. Um, and like I say, it's a very unique society because we're all joined by our interest in this one tumor type, which is very different from all the other societies I'm a member of. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for that. Um, Okay, we have lots of questions coming in now, so I'm going to try to to churn through them. Sue asks, what's the latest treatment? What are the latest treatment options for grade three well differentiated as well as uh, G3 poorly differentiated? Well, it's a great question, Sue. Um, you know, the recent WHO, World Health Organization staging system, really differentiated these two entities. Before, they were just called grade three. Um, but it was, it was learned that if you look under the microscope, some of these grade threes, and that's usually defined by the KI67 index being over 20%. If you look at some of these on the microscope, they have a very orderly pattern and therefore are called well differentiated, whereas other ones look very disorderly and the cells are different shapes. They have different amount of nuclei and chromatin in them that, that make them look much worse. And those are the neuroendocrine carcinomas or the poorly differentiated ones. Those poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas uh, behave much more aggressively than the well differentiated grade three. They do share high KI67 indices, but the, the poorly differentiated are going to be metastatic more early. They're going to grow more quickly. And that's a kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, if there's a good edge to that sort, it's that they're more susceptible to, uh, to chemotherapy. And often they'll be treated with platinum compounds um, and they can be pretty responsive. The bad news is that even though there may be a response, they will often start growing again and they're much more likely to, to lead to early death of patients than, than well differentiated tumors. So now that we've been able to really define these two different groups of grade three, we can be a little more aggressive surgically with the well-differentiated grade three uh, tumors and the treatments which formerly would have used IV, uh, pretty toxic uh, chemotherapy in these patients, sometimes may use oral chemotherapy uh, instead because those patients may respond actually pretty well to that and not need the IV chemotherapy. 
those patients, if they have somatostatin receptor uptake on, a, say, a gallium scan, they can still get PRRT, although they may not respond quite as well. Uh, but that's that's still an option. So those that differentiation is very important, especially for any of you out there who have a grade three. You know, to know whether whether it's well or poorly differentiated is it can be really key. Great, great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sue, for your question. I hope that helps. Um, next up, we have a question from Pamela. It says, is there a stool test for recurring gastric carcinoid tumors? Stool tests? Um, yeah, I'm not, not familiar with any. Uh, I'm embarrassed to say. If you know about it, I'd like to learn. Okay. Um, what would be a good test for uh, recurring gastric carcinoid tumors? Well, with gastric carcinoids, there are three different types, and it's a little complicated to explain, but, you know, the best way to find them is to do an upper endoscopy, to actually look at the stomach lining. And a lot of patients will have multiple tumors. They're often micronodular. You can just see little bumps on the inner lining of the stomach, and you can take biopsies and prove that. There's a, there are different types, whether they happen in the setting of people who have a kind of an autoimmune condition of their stomach where they develop antibodies to their, the cells that make acid. That's called atrophic gas, uh, gastritis. And those people get, that's probably the most common type where they get, that's called type one, and they get lots of small nodules. And most of those patients don't need surgery. Um, they can be on somatostatin analogs and do well. The second type is in patients who have MEN1, and they can get uh, multifocal gastric carcinoids as well. Uh, and then the third is the sporadic, which means that they don't have either one of those two things, and it just sort of develops on its own. Those tumors tend to be larger, more likely to involve lymph nodes. Um, the best test, again, is upper endoscopy uh, with biopsy. And CT scans are often important to make sure that there aren't any enlarged lymph nodes in the area, and gallium scans can help uh, determine that as well. So um, the gastrin levels can be helpful, but they're often elevated in patients with both type 1 and type 2 uh, uh, carcinoids, but that's not going to make the diagnosis, and there are a lot of things that interfere with that particular test. So really, endoscopy, uh, endoscopy, upper endoscopy with biopsy is the, the best way to diagnose and survey for them. Great. Thank you so much. I hope, hopefully that helped, uh, Pamela. And so for those that are just joining us uh, or joined us a little bit late today, which is totally fine, we just want to let you know that this video will live here and it will be evergreen on the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation Facebook page. You just go to the videos tab. And for those, if there's someone else in your network that you think would benefit from this, it will, that's not on Facebook, this will also be um, published on CCF's YouTube channel so they can find it there. Uh, if you're just joining us, let us know where you are in the world. And if Dr. Howell does a great job and answers a question that gives you a lot of value and helps you along this journey, a great way to visually let us know is to send a little thumbs up, a little emoji, or even a heart emoji down there at the bottom right hand uh, corner of your screen. That lets us know that we're doing a good job. Uh, and puts a smile on our faces. So uh, thank you for joining us out there. Our numbers are looking great today and we're about halfway through. So if you have questions for Dr. Howell, get them in while you can. Okay, moving forward with seeing a lot of thumbs up and heart emojis going as we are moving forward. So that's great news. Um, Cheryl says, you mentioned the net test and we actually had the creator of the net test on our first episode of Lunch with the Experts. Do you recommend it, Dr. Howell? What are your thoughts on it? Well, there have been several studies that have used the net test and shown its value. Uh, we don't use it, and I don't have much experience with it, except just having read the papers and read the, you know, how it was developed. And you know, I think in principle, it's it's a good idea. the The problem with any test, and that was with the net test or with the test that we would do, which would be tumor markers like pancreas, statin. Uh, chromogranin and serotonin is that if you get a, uh, an elevated value, whatever the normal may be, you're not going to act on that alone. You're going to really act based upon that plus the demonstration on, say, a CAT scan or a gallium scan that the disease is progressing. So the real question is, how do you integrate any of these tests 
uh, with imaging to follow patients. Our strategy is to do the best operation we can up front, and then after that, treat people with somatostatin analogs. And when we get progression, which we define usually by showing on CAT scan that new liver metastases show up, or lymph nodes or liver metastases are getting bigger, that's when we progress to the next stage of therapy. We consider somatostatin analogs as first line, but then we'll move on to peptide radio receptor therapy or everolimus, sunitinib, even uh, oral chemotherapy. So the decision to move from that, I would not base simply on a number from either the net test or pancreastatin level. I would have to see radiologic confirmation of progression. So those tests, net tests or biochemical markers are helpful in making the decision to move on. Because sometimes you might see in a patient that their liver metastasis increased by two millimeters in size. Well, is that really significant? Did they just measure it slightly differently today than they did from six months ago? Or is the tumor really progressing? And if you see a real a bump in whatever test you're using to follow, being the net test or pancreastatin, it might make you more likely to say, okay, it's time to switch gears and, and go to the next tier of therapy. But that's kind of the value uh, that, that we place on the markers. X-rays are really key. Got it, got it. Thank you so much. And thank you, Cheryl, for your question. We have a lot of people interested in, in this test, so uh, we get questions about it all the time. Um, so Linda asked a question. It says, is there a genetic component of NETS for our siblings or children? And I know this is an area where you spend a lot of time, Dr. Howell, and I actually hear this question a lot. What is the genetic component to neuroendocrine cancer as far as we know? Well, it's a little more obvious in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors because mm -hmm. there are several syndromes where people can get these. And so there's multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1 where people can get pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, parathyroid disease in the neck that cause kidney stones and high calcium. Um, and they also can get pituitary adenomas in the brain. Those people have a 50-50 chance of passing that predisposition on. Not everybody gets peanuts, but um, they need to be screened for them. There's a condition called von Hippel-Lindau syndrome where people get pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and pancreatic cysts and kidney cancers and certain uh, benign brain tumors uh, and spinal cord tumors, uh, in addition to retinal angiomas, and those patients are also at risk, maybe not quite as much as MEN1 patients. And there's neurofibromatosis and tuberous sclerosis types one and two. Um, in those families, we know the actual genes that are mutated that give rise to this predisposition. And if you're a member of one of those families, then you can certainly be tested. But the majority of people <clears throat> get these tumors without a family history, and screening those genes is really not helpful. Even more difficult is the small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, like we talked about a little while ago, where although there are some families where they're you know, we follow, maybe the biggest family that I follow has about five people who are affected. The one paper uh, from the NIH where they were able to determine the IPMK gene caused it had, I can't remember how many affected, but it might have been 13 or 15. But most families are small. They may only have a, a brother and a sister or a dad and a son who had right. it. And in that situation, it's very, very difficult. And, and, and right now it's impossible, although both us and the NIH are working very hard to, to try to find genes where we could do that kind of testing. So I think I answered your question, but if I didn't, Rain, redirect me to the part that I... I mean, I think that that was very valuable, but please uh, let us know if you have a follow-up question, um, uh, Linda, but thank you for your question. That's something that gets brought up a lot, so I'm glad Dr. Howell could take a moment to, to touch on that. Um, Okay, so we have a question. We have lots of questions coming in. So we've got about 20, 25 minutes left, everybody. We are going to do our best to get to them. But again, I just want to reiterate, if we don't, you can always follow up with us uh, to direct message us here at, at the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation's Facebook page or reach out to them directly on their website, carcinoid.org. So question, Dr. Howell from Jackie. I had all the different types of scans available before diagnosed by finding tumors by chance during gallbladder surgery. So she found tumors by chance in gallbladder surgery. Scans were clear. Now I only have a yearly CT scan. Do you, is that the best way for, to go, in your opinion? 
Okay, I, I'm not sure if I understand the question. She had a tumor diagnosed at gallbladder surgery, but it wasn't seen on a scan before gallbladder surgery? That's what I am reading. It had all the different types of scans available before di being diagnosed. It found the tumors by chance during a gallbladder surgery. The scans were clear, and now I only have yearly CT scans. I guess the question is, is there anything more that she should she should be doing? Besides just yeah. monitoring. Well, I mean, I can, as a surgeon, I can trace backwards, like, you know, sort of what happened in this case probably is, you know, most people get their gallbladders removed laparoscopically these days. And the only two tumors you're really going to find when you do a laparoscopic gallbladder surgery is a tumor on the liver. And so sometimes you look in there with a camera and you'll see kind of a white nodule on the surface of the liver. You'll do a biopsy and it's neuroendocrine tumor. Now, uh, as the question suggested, she, uh, she may have had a CT scan that didn't show the lesion, um, and that can happen. Um, lesions on the surface of the liver may not show up unless they're about a centimeter or so in size and they have a certain depth to them. If it's just kind of a surface plaque, which some of them can be where they're very thin, then a CAT scan may not show it. Also, CAT scans are not all equal. To really look to find liver metastases well, you need to have both an arterial and venous phase. Most CAT scans that are routinely done just have what's called a venous phase where they inject contrast, they wait a certain amount of time, 45 seconds, and then do the scan. With an arterial phase, you do uh, scanning very quickly after the injection of the contrast, and then you do it again at the same time as a venous phase that will show up lesions much, much better than kind of the routine CAT scan, which can, can miss it. CAT scans are very good at picking this up if they're done properly. So it's possible she had a CAT scan that didn't, wasn't phased in the right way to look for liver metastases. Um, as far as going forward, um, our practice is to primarily use CT scans. Um, and, and let me specifically talk about small bowel and uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, although it applies for duodenum gastric as well or colorectal. Um, CT scans have the advantages. They, they can show you the liver pretty well, uh, and it can also show regional lymph nodes and peritoneal nodules very well. So it's a really good survey of the abdomen. If you want to look specifically at the liver, an MRI is a little better uh, at finding liver lesions. And so if you're trying to assess the liver more specifically, then that may be a better test. And we call those two things, CTs and MRIs, anatomic imaging, to separate them from, say, a gallium scan, which we would call functional imaging. And what I mean by functional is it takes advantage of a, of a certain compound that'll bind to neuroendocrine tumors and make them light up. The other ones look at anatomy. They just take cross sections and show you pictures with a, a nodule in the liver. But a, a gallium PET scan will show you that a nodule actually has uptake of somatostatin uh, analog, which, you know, they're rich with these receptors on the cell surface. And it can really tell you that a lesion is indeed a neuroendocrine tumor. Those gallium scans are more expensive and uh, they can't be used routine for routine surveillance like you would with a CT scan or an MRI. Um, insurance companies will allow you to have a certain number of them in certain circumstances, but it's really hard to get them approved for just routine surveillance. We generally will, will scan our patients every six months for the first couple of years. If there's no evidence of disease, which is the minority of our patients, then you might go to annual scanning after that. But a lot of our patients, especially those with liver metastases, we're going to continue to do scans every six months. When there's progression, and we think they, they might be ready for another phase of therapy, say peptide rated receptor therapy, then we'll do a gallium scan to make sure that there's good uptake so that therapy will work. Outstanding. Thank you so much for that thorough breakdown of the scans that, that, that uh, made it really clear even for me. So uh, hopefully that helped. Um, so we have a question from Nitesh. Nitesh. Um, is basically concerned, I, I, I can see. It's like, what are the chances of, of, of this coming back? My first surgery was in January 2017. In June 2017, um, had surgery for, for liver lesions removal, um, post which yearly Dototar PET scan shows no signs of tumor. So everything seems to be fine. And now 
Um, he's just concerned about the chances of it coming back. And I guess maybe a follow-up question is how long when with no signs of, uh, of tumors should we monitor? Well, when somebody has liver met, unfortunately, if you look at studies that have, that have really examined this well, the recurrence rate at five years is about 95%. Mm. And maybe as high as 99% wow. at 10 years. So those numbers are not good. The good news about it is we have, you know, they grow very slowly. But the problem with, with liver metastases for anybody is that what we see at the initial surgery may be the tip of the iceberg. Somebody did a very interesting study where they, they took patients with neuroendocrine tumors and they took out a large section of the liver. And then they said, how many of these lesions in the liver did we see on the preoperative CT scan? And of course it finds the bigger ones, but if you slice the liver really thin, you will find lots of very tiny tumor nodules. So these things are present in the majority of people who have liver metastases, which I know for many of you to hear that it's very disheartening, but mm -hmm. at the same time, um, you know, treatments like somatostatin analogs may be effective in keeping these small lesions from growing for very long periods of time. But getting back to the question of Natesh is that, you know, if you had liver mets, there's still a high probability that one of these small things will at some point start growing. And that's why we have to have many different arms of therapy. So we have to expect that that's the rule rather than the exception for most people. And I, and again, I, I hate to say that to you, but because that's not what you want to hear, but that's that's the reality of these tumors. No, that's good to know. And and um, while it may be difficult to hear, I mean, it's important for people to understand exactly what they're dealing with and how to and how to proceed forward. So thanks for for answering that. Uh, so we have a question from Elaine, which specifically asks uh, your opinion as a surgeon. What are your thoughts on how many surgeries a patient can have? to resect liver and or small bowel due to reoccurring tumors? That's a great question. Um, I don't know if there's any number, um, but the what I tell patients is that surgery is hard on people. You know, we make incisions, it hurts, it takes six weeks to recover if everything goes well, uh, and you don't want to go through that every year. Um, the nice thing with neuroendocrine tumors is that we have other therapies that can really slow their progress for a long time. And so, so what my strategy is, to, is to try to do my best operation up front. But I see a lot of patients who have 20 or 30 liver lesions, and I can get rid of the majority of those, but I'm not going to get rid of 100% in most cases, not when you have that much. And as we just said in the question before, these tumors can recur. So we have to have kind of a long-term strategy. We're not gonna go back every year or every two years if there's a, a small liver lesion because just to go through surgery is just too much. And that's why we would then treat people with somatostatin analogs and hope that whatever's there will not grow for a, as long as possible. When it does grow, then we think about, we, we look at the, the scans and we say, well, if there are three or four lesions and we can remove them, maybe we should do that. Or what if you do a gallium scan and you see bone metastases or see things outside of the liver? And then you're kind of wondering, well, liver surgery is only going to treat the liver. It's not going to get to that bone metastasis. So maybe you want to give something that's going to get throughout your body and treat those other areas as well. So to answer your question specifically, yes, you can operate multiple times, but I try not to do it too often. I try to do one good operation and then we break out the other therapies sequentially. And, and only in specific patients will I do a second or third reoperation. And usually people who've get, who are getting other therapies and might have three, five, seven lesions that are continuing to grow through those therapies and the patient's in good shape and can handle another operation. But I wouldn't go back every year or every couple of years. Understood, thank you. Um... I have an interesting question from Janet. Janet says, I saw a cystic net tumor and a blood-filled tumor on a recent net webinar. Are there other types of net tumors besides what we normally think of or normally consider a net tumor? The question was even more complicated because it talked about an elevated chromogranin A. Again, whether that's, uh, that's a marker of 
a, a tumor or whether it's a false elevation, which can happen with proton pump inhibitors, kidney dysfunction, and a few other conditions is, is often difficult to sort out with that particular biochemical marker. So it may or may not be a, a real marker of a neuroendocrine tumor. And then you talked about pancreas showing uptake on a, on a gallium scanner. And so we're talking about several different things here, small bowel and now maybe pancreas. You got to recognize that on gallium scanning, there can be false positive, especially in the uncinate of the, of the pancreas. That happens up to 5% of people where they don't really have a tumor, but they'll see high uptake uh, in the uncinate process, which is near the head. Um, and some people can have false uptake in the tail because of a splenule, uh, which is an accessory spleen nearby. So, you know, if I were to see you in clinic, I would, I would really try to dissect all these different pieces of information and, and try to figure out, do I really think there's a pancreatic lesion or is this a false positive? Is the chromogranin elevated because of some other reason other than a neuroendocrine tumor? And the fact that you had the small bowel carcinoid, how are we going to keep, you know, an eye on you developing another one? And that, that's a, a very difficult and challenging situation. Got it, got it. Just want to send you a, a comment, Dr. Howell from, from Bridget, who says, Dr. James Howell is the best. He saved my life. Thanks for all that you do. So Thanks, you, Bridget. Yeah, you're getting some love out there. Um, okay, so we have a few more minutes, maybe a couple of questions. Shannon says, I have an extreme abdominal bloating. I have extreme abdominal bloating, rather. Can this be caused by the tumors? It feels like my organs are swollen and I have little pains pop up in my liver and pancreas area. Is that, is that what you think uh, that could be coming from, possibly? Well, I need to know a little more about, does she have a small bowel carcinoid or just bloating? Because, mm -hmm. you know, that's a common GI complaint. Right. Um, could be a lot of things, huh? If she had a previous one excised, let's say she had surgery and if they found a small bowel neuroendocrine tumor, which is, I think, what she's asking, you know, bloating can be a symptom of a number of things. But, you know, the worst case scenario is you, if somebody has a twist of the bowel or bowel stuck to a peritoneal nodule, that could cause bloating or obstruction. But there are lots of other things that can do that, you know, that are dietary in nature. So, Again, need to know a little more information and would really want to look at the imaging test to see if we could see anything. Got it, got it. Um, you know, when we talk about the University of Iowa and, and the team that we've, we've already mentioned that you have there, such a great net cancer center, how important is it for a patient to seek out a, a, an institution, a center like that, versus, uh, I don't want to just say like, the, you know, they're, they're normal providers. Some people don't have access to something like that. Is it important that they seek out a, a, a center that specializes in neuroendocrine cancer, or can they, can they navigate that from, from their home hospital, so to speak? Well, I think there, there are really good practitioners in neuroendocrine tumors across the United States. And I think one thing to look for is to see if they're a member of NANETS because that shows a certain dedication to the field. So if you're a medical oncologist, for example, that you're going to see is a member of NANETS, then that's a pretty good sign that they're fairly well versed in these tumors. Mm -hmm. If they're not, you can encourage them to, to come to our meetings where they can learn more. Right. And if they're not, you know, it, the one thing that impresses me about the population of neuroendocrine tumor patients is how connected you guys are with one another and how much you learn from each other and how much you go out and look for knowledge like this webinar. Um, and what you've learned is that there are a lot of practitioners who have never seen this tumor or seen one and they don't quite get it. And so I think if you get the sense that your practitioner isn't comfortable with these tumors, then absolutely seek an opinion elsewhere. It, I'd love it if it was at the University of Iowa, but there are good people in many different places across the United States. Not every place is good in all aspects of neuroendocrine cancer care. You might have a really good medical oncologist, a really good surgeon, really good PRT people, but it's really the combination of all those people. So you can see in a multidisciplinary fashion, uh, people who have different perspectives and different, you know, arrows in their quiver to treat these diseases that I think is really important. And the other message I want to say is, is 
most of you people are going to live a long time. So, you know, it's a big investment up front to, to make a good choice. And again, I'm, I'm not denigrating any other centers, but like I say, if you get the sense that your practitioner is not comfortable with neuroendocrine tumors, absolutely, they will be relieved if you seek out a center of excellence. Well, I think that's, you know, that's great to hear what you say and that, that this, I mean, I agree a hundred percent that this community is so tight and, and educated, as you mentioned in the beginning of the program, that means that, 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 uh, organizations like CCF are, are, are doing their job if we're educating the, uh, the, the people in the community about this. And, and I agree. I see the members of the community help each other within these comments, uh, on these, these Facebook lives. So I, I really love to see that and want to plus one, what you said there. Uh, and also I just want to thank you for, for joining us today. That's the end of our hour today, everybody. And <laughs> I see from a couple of audience members, uh, one says, thank you, Dr. Howell, very well handled. And another one says I needed a laugh. I'm assuming that was when uh, the uh, the feed cut out for a moment. So I want to thank you for handling well too. And if the laugh was at my expense, I will gladly lay myself down for the community of uh, the neuroendocrine cancer community. So <laughs> thank you for handling that so well. Um, and thanks for joining us. Thanks for everybody at home for joining us. As always, we hope that this program helped answer some of your questions. Again, reach out to carcinoid.org. You can reach out to CCF there for further information. Also, thanks again, as always, to our presenting sponsor, Lexicon Pharmaceuticals. We could not do this program without them. Thank you all at home. Thank you, Dr. Howell. We appreciate it. Uh, be healthy, be safe, everybody, and join us next week on Luncheon with the Experts. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.